briefly introduce myself and then we'll go around the panel. Um, um, I'm Chief Investment Officer of Soul Street Capital. We're uh, an investment management firm based in the UK with offices in uh, countries in Africa. And uh, we focus exclusively on investing in the African agricultural sector. Uh, we do invest across the whole value chain, um, uh, including primary production, but also on the input side uh, and processing, we invest in poultry and, and so on. Our focus is primarily on, on the Southern and East Africa part, and we invested across eight countries at the moment. Soul Street's been around 15 years. Um, we also aim to have a positive social impact um, as well as environmental impact, which we can achieve by supporting uh, smallholder farmers raising their productivity uh, and yields. Um, we've got a very uh, interesting topic today um, where we're looking at uh, the opportunities, how we can redefine agriculture. I'll just say a few words that at a very high level. There's just tremendous opportunity in the African agricultural sector. Um, Africa brings a huge diversity in crops that can be grown. Um, we obviously have all the tropical crops, for example, like rubber, cocoa. Um, we have uh, up on the plateau the ability to grow grains, soya and so on, sorghum um, at high altitudes, tea, tea and coffee, flowers. And then down on the coast, the hot, sweaty areas, uh, the uh, cane and uh, bananas. And then, of course, in the Cape area, Mediterranean crops. So there's a tremendous opportunity and, and many forecasts of, of water security show issues that are in the world in all the key growing areas, particularly the California uh, and in Europe with uh, water security in the long run. And the central part of Africa in particular offers us huge advantages there. Um, and, but on the other hand, there are risks and, and challenges to that. And the panel today are gonna help us solve and discuss those risks. You see the export opportunities, obviously, um, um, but that obviously leads to questions about uh, shipping, and uh, we'll be talking about that. There's volatility in weather coming because of climate change, and uh, we'll be talking about how to ensure that. Um, and then also the challenges with smallholder farmers, yields on maize in sub-Saharan Africa, generally around two tons a hectare north of South Africa, um, whereas the global average is six tons. How do we get that, that yield higher? Well, one of the important parts of that jigsaw is to get the right seed. And uh, we'll be discussing seed as well. And then finally, the job creation opportunity in the agricultural sector. Um, some 60% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa live on smallholder farms. Um, so from that point of view, if you like self-employed, but uh, able to raise, can we raise their income? But also the enormous job, um, enormous uh, potential to, to create jobs from building agricultural businesses. So thank you. I just um, wanted to give that high level because we'll be able to solve all those problems over this, this webinar, hopefully. Um, but thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll first start off with Bupin. And Bupin, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, um, saying a few words, and then uh, I'll ask some questions, and then we'll, we'll go uh, around the panel. Um, after thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me on this panel. And uh, the subject matter is uh, just uh, most appropriate for the geopolitics and geoeconomics we live in right now. Uh, Advanta Seeds is a uh, group company of a UPL uh, group worldwide, which is about $6 billion group. Uh, Advanta, uh, which is operating out of uh, UK, and US and India, and um, they have presence in about 154 countries. They are into multiple activities, uh, agrochemical, uh, you know, digitalizations, uh, carbon trading, uh, post-harvest technologies, uh, basic uh, chemicals and performance chemicals, multiple uh, divisions are there. Out of that, one company which is highly focused on seed is uh, Advanta. Edwanda Seed Headquarters is in Dubai. Uh, from Dubai, uh, we, we have a presence in about 84 countries, which we manage via 18 uh, subsidiaries, which are situated in countries like Australia, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, India, uh, Argentina, Brazil, US, and uh, you know, in, in uh, Africa, we have offices in uh, Kenya and uh, South Africa. So that is in nutshell. In terms of our, our technologies, uh, we are primarily focused on uh, select uh, crop where we have a competency in terms of germplasm 
uh, they are like uh, sorghum, uh, tropical, subtropical corn, uh, sunflower, oil seed, uh, canola, and among vegetables, we are primarily into brassica seeds and the uh, okra and the and the uh, cauliflower, etc. So that is in a cell what we offer. In terms of activity, uh, we we are R&D based company. Uh, so we have more than 200 plant breeders who are who are masters and PhD in the breeding. Their job is to identify the breeding targets uh, for a given population and given environment, and it try to design the crop uh, which are suitable, most suitable for those countries and environment. Then advance it for the commercialization, produce it, pack it, and market it. That's what we have been doing. It's about more than 60 years old company in Nutsel. Great, thank you, uh, Pippin. Um, Nicole, would you mind introducing yourself uh, as well? Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Gary. So I'm Nicole Maske. Um, I was the co-founder of EOS Capital, a Namibian private equity firm, um, and have grown that business over the last seven years, um, initially private equity firm, um, but then later we did infrastructure fund and an agri fund. Um, I recently left uh, at the end of May, and uh, in my, my personal capacity, I'm now um, focusing on really helping to create jobs in Namibia. So I think we spoke earlier about, you know, the unemployment that we that we see on the continent. I mean, in Namibia, it's about probably around 36% now, so about 30%. Um, but, but the reality is it's quite a solvable problem. So we need to create about 350,000 jobs and we've, we've solved, solved our unemployment uh, problem to a large extent. So my focus is really gonna be on helping others to develop their projects and bring them to a bankable, a, bankable place and that includes kind of helping them raise develop, development capital we can discuss more around the challenges of, of why um, we don't see more projects coming online in the in agri space. Uh, thanks very much Nicole. Um, George perhaps you could introduce yourself as well. Thanks. Hi good morning everyone uh, my name is George Wood I am director of the customer operations group for DHL Express sub-Saharan Africa um, I look after 51 countries uh, in the region. I've been with DHL for four years now. Um, yeah, and I'm going to talk about the, uh, the shipping aspects um, for agriculture, as this is a massive opportunity for the con continent. Um, and like Nicole says, we need, to, uh, we, we need to create jobs, and this could be a perfect time to do that. Thanks very much, George. Um, and Leslie, uh, welcome. And uh, if you could introduce yourself and uh, Ark. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Leslie Njovu, and I am the CEO of the African Risk Capacity Limited. Uh, the African Risk Capacity Limited is the largest uh, insurer of weather-related risks on the African uh, continent. Uh, we provide parametric insurance which is insurance that is based on uh, modeled uh, losses using satellite data, which enables us to be very scalable, uh, scale, scalable and to pay claims uh, rapidly, usually within 10 business days of an event uh, happening. Uh, ARC operates across three client segments. We provide macro insurance at the level of governments, uh, but we also provide insurance to humanitarian agencies like the World Food Program and the International Red Cross. We are also active in working in the agricultural uh, sector, providing insurance to small and medium scale uh, farmers. The role that we play in the agricultural value chain uh, is uh, in de-risking uh, investments into uh, agriculture which you all know is a priority segment uh, for African economies at large, uh, being a large contributor to GDP and a large contributor to uh, employment. And at the moment, given where we are in the world uh, with the impact of climate change, uh, there is an increasing frequency and severity of weather related disasters and uh, insurance can play a role then in protecting investments in the sector. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, so what, what we're going to do now is to go through uh, panelists one by one and I'll, I'll ask a few questions. Uh, if anyone would like to 
ask any questions uh, of that panelist, please feel free to put it on the chat and we'll try and deal with it at the time. But we'll also have a slot at the end to pick up on any questions we can. So I'll I'll uh, launch straight in with Rupin, um, and uh, perhaps we can start off talking about seed. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that one of the key issues we need to solve is 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 the productivity of uh, on farm in Africa. And uh, could you talk a little bit about about that and and how introducing improved seed can help? Sorry, Bupin, you're on uh, mute. Thanks. Yeah, as you indicated, uh, global productivity is about six metric ton per hectare vis-a-vis -vis Africa, two metric ton per hectare, and that gap is a real opportunity. And uh, and actually, is a real opportunity. Why do I say real opportunity? Because uh, Africa, as a continent, still has sixty percent of arable land, which is not cultivated. So if, if you want to go horizontally, that is an opportunity. If you want to go uh, vertically, increasing the productivity per hectare from a you know, two ton to three or four, five ton is a possibility. There are a variety of pathways to go there, but the area I come from seed is a very powerful pathway. Uh, currently, uh, Africa, most of the farmers, uh, they are using the traditional uh, seeds, which are they are just using from generation to generation. We have set up a research station in Eldorat uh, in, in uh, near Kenya. Uh, this is for about eight years now for us, and we are planning to expand that uh, substations there. Uh, you know, the, the idea is to uh, make sure our germ, germ plasm, which we have it, is adapting to that environment uh, with a basic trait like a agronomic trait, uh, which can fit into the, those ecosystem and increase higher productivity in terms of biomass per hectare and or if possible, uh, better nutritional focus. So, you know, there, there's a one organization called Access to Seeds as a part of the World Benchmark Alliance, uh, you know, which is working with the UN agency for SDG. And in that, one of the important aspect is like, like access to medicine is important, access to justice is important, uh, but access to seed is extremely important. So they have developed a matrix and we started participating in that. And now we are number one, uh, number two com company in last survey, uh, you know, participating in that area. So access to, simple by changing the access to seed, rem everything remaining the same. Productivity will can go by 50% to 100%, depending on the country we are talking about. And these are uh, the pilot pro projects we are doing for last two years, and the results are very, very encouraging. So, so to my mind, this is a, this is a massive opportunity, and there's a way of moving forward. There are other part also like increasing fertilizer uses automatically will come in the moment you are go, going for the hybrid seeds, use of the agrochemicals or biologicals and use of mechanizations. Uh, the different domains, they can they are working on it, but from seed point of view, that is what uh, we are actively engaged in. Thanks, Pippin. I, I, it does, uh, your comments confirm a lot of what, what we've seen. Um, uh, we grow um, seed across a few countries in Africa produce it for seed companies. And, and, I'm, and we're the largest grower of seed in producer in Tanzania, for example. And it's a wide range of seed that we produce. Um, but our experience, we uh, looking at um, doing tests on the ground, there's a lot of farmers yield. You can go from sort of two tons a hectare to around four tons by two, just doing two things. One is, um, as you say, getting the right seed. Um, and uh, in particular, switching to a hybrid seed. So it's not GMO, it's, it's, it's a hybrid seed. And secondly, getting technique right on farm, particular conservation farming team. So it's just enormous to double, to have that potential to double the yields. It is incredible, the impact. And just listening to your range of crops, um, there's quite a lot of, uh, well, there's some overlap, uh, obviously, with the export crops coming out of the Ukraine and, and Russia. And given, given the, um, the issues there now and the likely shortfalls um, going forward, people are obviously looking at alternative places to grow these crops. And perhaps you can discuss uh, that and how that overlaps with your, you know, the sort of things you're bringing to Africa. Sure. In fact, uh, it's really uh, amazing. Africa has all the ingredients to be an agriculture powerhouse in the world. Uh, with the available technology, access to finance, but they are not. In fact, most of the African countries are importing food items, including edible oil. 
All right. So I, I give, give you one example. Uh, three years ago, we, I visited Tanzania and I understood uh, that Tanzania has nearly 1.5 to 2 million hectare of sunflower. Almost 100% is OP sunflower, open pollinated sunflower. Advanta uh, is known in the world as a high-end hybrid sunflower seed company, having variety of traits, not only of the production per hectare, but also uh, different fatty acid component. You know, the, the uh, lino, linoleic acid, hyolic acid, steric acid, because this composition has an impact on the health of the heart. So we went there and, and we just did some small trial and uh, as against the productivity of a Tanzanian farmer average about uh, 300 kg to 400 kilogram per hectare by simply replacing a hybrid, a hybrid uh, variety of Advanta, which is very low end hybrid, not a really high end hybrid because price is very, there are highly price uh, sensitive markets. By doing that, that three to 400 kg uh, per hectare went up to nearly 900 kg to one metric ton per hectare, simple. Just imagine calculation 1.5 million hectare into 2 million hectare multiply by productivity going up by three times. We did this calculation and, and our sunflower has another component. The local sunflower which they have is about 38 to 40 percent oil seed percentage per kilogram, 100 gram. In our case, this the oil seed percentage is about 50 percent. So, so straight away your production goes up, oil seed production goes up and whatever they are consuming after fulfilling that consumption, Tanzania has a potential to become a biggest exporting company of oil seed in Africa. There are hurdles though. We realized that uh, uh, Tanzania had a oil crossing uh, units a couple of decades ago. In fact, I visited one uh, closed one, shutdown unit uh, because of the government policies, different priorities. I realized that the earlier, maybe two decades ago, they had started doing that activity, but they shut down, it was not economically viable. So there is a bottleneck. If farmer, we encourage farmer to produce more, the problem will be who will buy because there are no crossing capacity there, ex oil extraction capacity there. So to me, it is an obstacle today, but with all the players we are talking on the panel, if you can really combine together and start funding the key entrepreneur there, and they start you know, setting this ext extraction plant, probably they start doing crude oil extraction and refining and start marketing it. Few people, we are already encouraging it. We are not into that business, but from our side, we are just tying up with them and that activity is going on. But few more uh, players we can combine, I think we can accelerate this growth. And this can be, a. Uh, we made some uh, back of envelope calculations about a billion dollar value we can create in this system by, by doing this, by, by doing only 50% of hybridization, not even 100% of hybridization. Thanks, thanks, Peter. I don't know if those listening to the seminar, but um, you know, I, I agree 100%. I don't know if you, um, it, it's just when somebody talks about opportunities like this, just the scale of, and you know, how positive this opportunity is for Africa and for places like Tanzania, but it, you know, also Ethiopia, Sudan, very good conditions, parts of West Africa for growing sunflower seed. Obviously, South Africa is a big producer. Um, I mean, the scale of it, you know, you're talking about more than a doubling in yield. It's just under two thirds of the world's sunflower oil exports come out of Ukraine and Russia. This is the opportunity for Africa to provide enormous um, uh, in, in, pre, in production. And who's it gonna benefit? It's gonna benefit the smallholder farmer, that million and a half hectares in Tanzania, all smallholder farmers. Their incomes are gonna rise and two thirds of them are women. This is an enormous opportunity. And, and th that sort of um, ability to create capacity through crushing, these are, these are fixable problems. These are fixable, you know, it's just a great example that the opportunities that's sitting in, in front of us uh, in Africa. Um, thanks, and I think e even on the May side as well, it's the same basic formula, you know, doubling yields and trying to improve. And, and um, maybe just a final question on the vegetable side, are you seeing, um, you know, much potential as well in Africa? Um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Same, same scenario, I think. Before I go to vegetable, if you, uh, with your permission, I give you an example, which is very interesting on the sorghum. Uh, so, world has about 45 to 50 million hectares sorghum. Out of that, Africa has about 35 million hectares. Sorghum is a native to Africa. And you know what? It's, it's, it's a climate smart crop. 
per hectare highest biomass in most trying condition, we can have it. We are presence in USA, in Argentina, in Brazil with the sunflower, the sorghum, that the productivity in those markets are about eight metric ton average per hectare. While in Africa, it is less than one metric ton. And wherever we just replaced OP sorghum with our hybrid uh, sorghum, our productivity is going up by three to four times. But the point is that has to be accompanied by uh, increased use of uh, fertilizer primarily and a little bit of agrochemical. If you do that, uh, but the point is there, there the point is farmers are ready to accept, right? But the, he says that the moment I produce more, what do I do with that? There's no market. So then we, in, in Kenya, for example, is a live example, uh, you know, in, in, uh, we went to, what do, what do we do with this? So our team, we had a brainstorming. He said, uh, we, we went to Kenya uh, breweries, Kenyan breweries who are making uh, uh, beer. Uh, and then we, we provided our sample, then we did a trial. And now they launched a uh, beer made out of sorghum. Uh, this is something we learned in, in China and the sorghum is very high quality and they started marketing it, right, for example. And now they are, we are helping them that build breweries to have a command area from there they get high end uh, sorghum uh, on regular basis, for example. So there's one another example I, I can quote, this is what we are doing right now. Coming to the vegetable part of it, uh, uh, biggest area in vegetable uh, in, in Africa is under okra. Uh, you know, this lady's finger that are and very common in Asia and Africa. Uh, they are also again all OP. Uh, Advanta is number one hybrid okra company in the world right now. We started doing trialing there uh, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa. In all the three countries, uh, we now go, got the first data. Yield data are very good. Uh, they like it. Color is also very good. Dark green, they like it. What they don't like in the what our hybrid is because they require more stickiness. You know, okra they use for you know soup, right? Unlike in Asian country for the vegetable, for example. So now we have to incorporate element uh, of of the stickiness more. We our scientists are working on it. Uh, we are thinking to uh, open a research station in South Africa for this purpose, which will serve South Africa as well as Eastern Africa. So that is what one example. There are a few more, many more examples are there, but uh, doing a lot of activities on those front to adapt our genetics to African need. Excellent, thanks, Bupin. That's very helpful. So we've solved uh, Ukrainian shortfalls <laughs> uh, for corn and and, and sunflower, and uh, shown how it can be done, and also create massive businesses in Africa. Um, so thank you very much. Let's let's go on to Nicole and uh, talk a bit about Namibia. Um, Nicole, Nicole, it'd be useful to talk about initially what, what opportunities and advantages you see in Namibia um, and potentials, you know, to invest in, in the agricultural value chain. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I mean, I think, as you said, the opportunities are right in front of us. And I mean, we really have an opportunity here in Namibia um, to, to do a number of things that could, could create jobs um, on the agri side. So, I mean, I think firstly, if you just look at some of the crops that we could plant here, I mean, we've had a lot of success with the, the table grapes and the dates in the south because, you know, our crop comes, comes to market a couple of weeks beforehand, so you can get higher prices. And we've seen the same successes with the blueberries up in the north. Um, and there's an advantage for, for a number of other crops as well. Um, when we were, when I was at EOS, we were looking at, you know, avocados as well and citrus. Um, and a couple of others. And, and the reality is the opportunities are there. And we need to, we need to find a way of bringing together you know, the, tech, the technical experts, the people that know those crops together with the local farmers to actually uh, make these opportunities happen. And then along the value chain, I mean, in, in Namibia, we don't have storage facilities for you know, our onions and our potatoes, which, which impacts the prices um, that, that the farmers can get. We also don't have a sorting facility. Um, so again, you're kind of at the mercy of, of your retailers, um, who being the judge as well as the as, as well as the buyer. Um, and then, if you've managed to create more primary production here, you can you can move along um, the value chain to processing. It's a great place to, to grow sunflowers as well. So ideally, we would make our own um, sunflower oil here. Um, and I think you know if you look at what's happening in the region, Namibia really offers you a great you know a great location to to invest in. You know, we're very stable politically. Um, socioeconomically, it, it, you know, things are things are good. You understand the policies. It's good rule of law. Um, we've got, although it's a small market locally, you know, our port is is um, 
is set up to export very very well as well as into the region so you know it's got a lot of um, benefits and then obviously it's, it's got lots of land investors keep asking me but have you got land and i said yes it's the one thing we've got lots of land sunshine so yeah agreed and, and i think the 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 weather advantage is there and it you know, namibia obviously has the potential to create a lot of cheap power um, and uh, obviously people talking about hydrogen, but, but just basic, just basic solar seems yep. to work so well there. Um, so if one is looking at processing or sitting up in other parts of the value chain, it seems to be something one can get a great cost advantage. Yeah. Um, and it, it, I just, just from our experience as well, to talk a little bit about uh, table grapes and dates <clears throat> down on the uh, Orange River, um, you know, that, that time window you know the grapes are the first to harvest in the southern hemisphere um, gives you the premium on the price and you've got reliable water um, it's also the the weather advantage you know no hail no rain which, um, no frost these things if you go you know to the uppington area where a lot of table grapes are grown or in the south those are risks there weather risk um, so it's and then on the date palms it's, it's probably 99 percent of the world's date palms are grown in the northern hemisphere there's virtually nothing in the southern hemisphere. And this is one of the very few places in the world you can grow date palms. You need a desert with a big river. Um, and so you have this fantastic counter seasonal opportunity. And there's a great export market that can be created out of date palms. And we're certainly very bullish and active there. Uh, thanks. And then um, I just wanted to also, you know, in terms of um, fundraising, and, and uh, I know it's, it's always difficult, but just to perhaps give us some. Some of your experiences uh, on that side. Well, look, so I mean, I think for me, you know, as much as the opportunities are right there in front of us, um, one of my frustrations while I was at EOS was that um, there were two parts that were really holding us back in terms of, of, of seeing these opportunities come to fruition. And the first side is, is, is access to funding in terms of, you know, the LP's general, you know, or investors' general um, aversion to primary production and uh, to investing in startups. So, you know, early stage projects, you know, if you look at dates, for example, you've got seven years before you, you start seeing some cash come in. And you know, that's difficult if you're in a private equity type environment where you've got a, a 10 year horizon. So, you know, we ultimately then ro ro raised money from local investors who had kind of a different, a different view on things. But I do see that as a challenge. We saw it on the infrastructure side as well, that, that, there's, that, that there's not that money in the development side, you know, specifically for startup primary production. But the second problem, and, and that's the one that I'm, you know, now going to be focusing a lot more on is, is actually around the pipeline. So, you know, we, we hear about these opportunities, you know, I've, I've heard about sunflower oil production here a couple of times, um, but some of the projects don't quite come to fruition. And I think that's, that's first of all, kind of around the you know, the skills that there are and actually bringing these projects to, to the right level of bankability, then a lack of, of funding around, you know, the development of the project. So I think, you know, the funding is available, but you have to find it in different pockets. You know, it's not your typical, like, you know, bank funding that you've got. Um, and I think if you, can, if you can solve that problem around how do you bring more projects on in, in terms of actually getting them to bankable level, um, you can actually start seeing some of these opportunities we all know are in front of us, you know, come to come to fruition. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think just just some some comments there. I mean, we, we we have invested in primary production as well as you know processing and and inputs and so on. And what what our, our our experience has been is that the investors in primary production tend to be different. Um, to the investor, let's call it in a processing plant, which might be a private equity type investor. And the primary production investors are, are investors in real assets. So they tend to be big pension funds uh, in, in Europe, in North America, um, looking for real assets. They're looking for something that looks a bit like a property. It's a, a big piece of asset throwing a yield off. And that yield is linked to food inflation and some, maybe the price of dates, the price of grapes, the price of blueberries, the price of citrus. And so um, being able to offer that basket, which maybe, maybe it can, um, you know, producing an interesting yield a lot, and they're very long-term. So they, they, they want permanent capital vehicles. They don't want a 10-year fund. Um, and they're very deep-pocketed. 
from if you put yourself in the position of let's call it a US pinch fund who has farmland already, um, this is Namibia is a very interesting option because you've got the low political risk there, but yet the ability to grow you know crops in unique locations. So and you could provide an alternative to California for some of those crops uh, where there's obviously this. Um, but I think it, 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 it and our, 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 our sort of experience has been to focus on different investors for the primary one from the, the moment. Um, thanks, and, and, and perhaps could you talk a little bit more about storage and, and what you see there as well in terms of, in, in Namibia? Look, I mean, if, if I look at one of the opportunities, and, and here I'm you know, working with a, a group of local guys that um, have got a great idea, um, but they, they don't really have any experience on the, on the agri side in terms of this. Um, and they'd like to set up a, a storage and sorting facility for, for onions and, and potatoes um, up in the north, which is something we don't have. Um, so, you know, if you can actually set up a storage facility, you're able to give your smallholder farmers, you know, better prices for their crops because at the moment a lot of the crops are actually going off or they're selling it at suboptimal prices. So, you know, this is one of those projects where the guys actually need need technical skills um, and support to actually make the, the, the project happen. Um, so that kind of opportunity is there. Um, we're looking at more storage facilities at the coast as well. You know, with Wildfish Bay, with the port um, and the opportunity to export, and then potentially a dry port inland to actually service some of the, you know, our, our landlocked neighbours. And so there's definitely opportunity. And, and as you say, as, as people move more to, to solar, um, to, you know, uh, lease, leasing of refrigeration in terms of cold storage and so on, these things become a lot more affordable um, uh, and uh, make better investment opportunities as well. Thanks, Nicole. There is a question uh, from one of the, the people uh, watching, which is, are, are you working with uh, regionally? Are you working regionally to solve problems um, that you face in Namibia, such as the lack of storage facilities? Yeah, look, I think if, if you're doing projects in Namibia, you kind of have to think regionally because the market here is just so small. You know, I'm working on an aquaculture project that ultimately would serve, you know, the neighboring countries as well. Or you know the storage facilities um, could could then technically uh, serve some of the neighbours in, in the north as well. So I think it makes sense in a market like this that, that we provide those uh, to neighbours as well. And Nicole, I, I, one of the ones we looked at it uh, to help Bupin out here, but I think the um, it does seem there's an opportunity to, to grow seed as well in the very north um, of Namibia, and um, there's such a shortage of seed in Angola. Um, and it might be quite interesting as well. And it brings greater diversity to a primary production platform there. But um, yeah, it, it, it is, you look at Namibia, people don't think there's variety, but those are pretty, that's a pretty broad range of crops that one can grow there. Definitely, definitely. Okay, well, thanks very much, Nicole. And um, perhaps George, we could um, go on to you now. And, um, and it would be useful to, um, to just kick off to talk a little bit about um, some of the disruptions you've seen in, in shipping and so on that's arisen from, you know, uh, well, I guess pandemic, but also perhaps, you know, as a result of the Ukraine, Ukrainian invasion. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gary. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so so from a disruption um, perspective, and this is this is really a commercial airline um, perspective. Um, First, we've got COVID. Uh, we're still not uh, back to pre-COVID levels of capacity. Um, and then we've got the war in Ukraine as well. Um, that is uh, having an impact. I can give you a little bit uh, on the air freight industry. Um, we've actually seen volume soften. Uh, it's down 5% year on year uh, versus last year. Um, inflation still playing a major role in global uh, volume uh, movements. E-commerce is actually contributing to global air volumes and this is likely to increase um, in the coming months, obviously, uh, towards Christmas. Uh, and then, yes, we've got Ukraine-Russia cri uh, crisis um, and that's also affecting it. What do we know about capacity? Overall capacity uh, down 12%. 
um, June 22 versus June 19. That's month on month uh, in, improvement continued. However, we're seeing a passenger capacity down by nearly 22% uh, in June 22 versus June 19. We're about 89% uh, level of pre-COVID levels um, in total. Um, IATA themselves, which is the, uh, the organization, uh, the, the Association of International Air Travel, um, they predicted we're not going to be back where we were pre-COVID until 2024. So we're still going to see um, uh, disruptions um, and airlines aren't going to re-establish their schedules uh, probably for another year. I'm hoping it's going to be before that. We're seeing some evidence that we may hit 2023, we may be back. Another big thing, jet fuel. Um, we all know petrol's all-time high, especially in South Africa. Um, and prices touched uh, 172 US dollars a barrel in June uh, 22. What does that mean? Well, it means prices, air freight prices, higher. Um, oil inventories remain low uh, and <laughs> Ukraine and Russia situation continuing to call, uh, cause oil uh, disruptions. So what does that mean on air freight rates? Uh, the remaining high uh, with signs of softening on a few trade lanes. Uh, in April 22, rates globally were, wait for it, 133% higher versus the 20 versus 2019. Absolutely astonishing. And rates expected to remain high because there's capacity issues. Um, so that's where we are. So like, sorry, sorry to play, paint such a bleak picture, but that was unfortunately where we are from a uh, air freight um, perspective. And um, we're still in that COVID, what I call the COVID hangar or the COVID babalas. Yeah, thanks. Could, could you perhaps give us a, like a case study, you know, related to agriculture, you know, sort of, sort of things you're being asked for given given the various uh, issues globally on, on shipping. Yeah, so, so, so I mentioned e-commerce and, and we've seen, we've got huge focus on agriculture as a business. So as a regional uh, a regional business, um, our CEO, uh, Henny Haymans, his main focus is on the agriculture sector. So at DHL Express, we have a first um, globally, we have a, a new uh, regional um, commercial manager for the agriculture sector, never been thought that there is none in any other region. So the focus we're having here is a lot of that comes through my desk is, okay, where can I, I'm shipping, say, vanilla pods, shipping vanilla pods from Madagascar to Canada is, okay, have we done our due diligence? Um, that's very important. We've got to understand our market, where are we shipping to? We need to understand what, um, what are we shipping? Um, we need to classify it um, with the harmonized tariff system. And then we need to investigate a destination. What are the requirements? Are we sending business to business? So are we supplying a supplier who makes food? Or are we selling with the rise of e-commerce? Are we so a website selling food? to the consumer in Canada, because we found out there's actually two, um, two, different, uh, two different scenarios. So if we look at the vanilla pods into Canada and we want to do business to business, um, we found that we, uh, the Canadian importer needs a safe food uh, for Canadians license to import that food into the vanilla pods into Canada. Whereas if we look at the B2C, the uh, business to uh, customer is the only requirements, you don't need that license. It, the, uh, the conditions of import, the material must be clean and free of pests of soil, and it is subject to inspection. Now, inspection, Gary, is very, it, this is a this is a key point um, for uh, food shippers in the region. 
especially into Europe. We're seeing a, uh, we, we talk about non-tariff barriers in the, in the industry. Well, we've got the FITO border inspection fees can go up to 150 euro per shipment. So if you're sending samples, you know, to, to potential customers, it can become very, very uh, expensive. And it certainly, you know, it, it really, it really sort of like takes the small players out of the game because they can't afford that. And this is what we're trying to see is trying to find, you know, how do we ship more? How do we, how do we ship more uh, cost effective? Is understand what you're shipping, understand how much you're shipping. That is very important because it's all about weight breaks and what service provider to use. If you're sending small samples is, yes, you're going to go to a courier and, and you need to get it there quick to win that tender. You need to use a courier because they're quick and it's, it, it's cheaper. Uh, it, it's cheaper for those small, small shipments. Then we've got the freight forwarding. Okay, so that's the bigger shipment. You don't want to put three tons onto a courier network because that is just going to be prohibitively expensive. So you need to look maybe a freight forwarder where the prices go down the more product you've got. Or indeed, if you're talking very big amounts, you're going to look at a C option. But you've also got to take into account your customers' timelines. So how quick do I need to get it there? Um, and also, it's using the correct packaging. We see a lot where shippers, they could improve their logistics costs by reducing the size of their packaging. Okay, so from an express uh, career uh, perspective, um, the airlines, they use uh, volumetric machines that measure the parcel. And if that is more than the scale weight, so if you put a shipment on a scale, it says one kilo, but the, the volumetric is five kilos, you're gonna be charged five kilos. So look at your packaging. Your packaging is key. Also, how do you drive down costs? You leverage on free trade agreements. Not many people know about free trade agreements. Go to the WTO website, have a look. Does my country have a free trade agreement with uh, the EU, with Canada, wherever my market is? Do we have that? Can I, what am I shipping? Is it included in that free trade agreement? It may be duty free, but it also is... <laughs> People see free trade agreements and they think there's no duties, uh, VAT and duties at all. Unfortunately, unless the commodity is VAT exempt in the country of import, VAT will always be attractive. Um, however, if you use the free trade agreement, we're talking about the duty element of it. It may be duty free, but also it may be reduced duties. OK, so that's another thing is just bring that price down and keep us competitive by leveraging what's there at the moment. Okay, well, thanks very much, George. There are a couple of related questions that have come up, but I think what we'll do is uh, go on to Leslie first, and then we can try and pick those up at the end relating to the cost of exporting in general and how to um, put agreements in place to uh, for inspections. Um, mm. but Leslie, perhaps we could um, kick off first to, um, if you could uh, perhaps explain to us how it all works, uh, that you can uh, price uh, insurance, you know, given it's quite difficult to get weather data, et cetera, and it'd be useful to hear how that's done. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Gary. Uh, we run our insurance programs uh, of data that we collect from our satellites so in the last 10-ish uh, years, there have been a number of uh, weather satellites that have been launched by the Americans, by the Europeans, uh, and by the Chinese most, uh, most, most recently. Then these satellites provide uh, weather data uh, to companies like ourselves. Some of the data is real-time, but some of the data is with a, is with a delay. 
Uh, in most cases, the data is uh, provided freely uh, on uh, some websites, which means that uh, we can figure out what the probability of a drought is uh, in, a, say, a small village in, uh, in Kenya using the historical uh, uh, rainfall uh, data. On the basis of that, we can figure out what the probability of a drought uh, is going forward. And on the back of that, then price uh, an insurance uh, product that will protect uh, farmers in, in that area from uh, the, uh, the financial impact of, of a drought. The major advantage of using parametric insurance like we do is it enables a very rapid payment of claims because we are able to model what the expected uh, cost of a drought uh, can, uh, can be uh, in a short amount of time. We typically pay claims within 10 uh, business days of an event uh, happening. Uh, furthermore, the parametric insurance approach enables us to be hyperscalable because as I was just explaining uh, earlier, as long as we can access uh, the satellite data, we can create an insurance program and we don't need to have any boots on the, on the, on the ground. And of course, what we are doing on the insurance side is helping to make farmers more resilient in the face of climate change, but is also then protecting uh, the value chain. You know, when you think about processors that rely on uh, outgrowers, so if their outgrowers are more resilient to climate change, that makes uh, even the processors better off themselves. And finally, we are helping protect some of the financial investments that are going into the agricultural sector to address the problems of productivity uh, that have already been uh, eloquently explained by my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, you mentioned the three sort of main areas where, where you uh, deliver your product through. I think it'd be worth talking a little bit about that and within that um, explaining how it can help the banking sector in general, uh, given their involvement in the agriculture sector. Thanks. Yep. So insurance is by its nature a, a very flexible tool and can be used to address uh, a number of risks. Uh, the first risk that governments tend to be concerned about is around uh, food security, you know, i.e. Uh, is there enough food in the country uh, to feed the, uh, the population? Uh, then when you think about it, if there is a very large uh, scale weather event, such as a drought in a country, it does uh, negatively impact uh, food supply. The cost of providing additional food to the affected population within a country can be again modeled based on the severity of the drought, which, result, which can be uh, uh, estimated from the satellite uh, data. Once we have these numbers, if we pay out a claim to the government, then they have the funding necessary to be able to launch uh, a relief uh, uh, efforts for the affected population. So this is the first class uh, of, of, of uh, customers that we serve. So providing insurance at the level of the government, uh, targeting mainly uh, food security and the cost of feeding people uh, after a major weather uh, event. And this is what we call in our jargon, macro insurance. We run uh, similar uh, insurance programs for the humanitarian agencies. Uh, because uh, the humanitarian agencies very often have to intervene after uh, a major drought or a major uh, flood. Uh, and again, the logic there is similar to that of providing insurance to a government. The faster the World Food Program can get uh, funding to launch uh, uh, relief operations, then the better the outcomes for the affected uh, population. Then uh, we also provide insurance uh, uh, to small to medium scale farmers uh, through intermediaries. And this is what we would call micro or meso insurance. And this targets revenue and asset protection uh, primarily. Uh, in meso insurance, uh, insurance a bank for a portfolio of agriculture related uh, loans uh, against uh, excess default because as a bank, 
you can do all the credit due diligence that you want uh, uh, on farmers, you know, looking at the traditional five Cs. But if there is a severe drought in one particular region, there's going to be a massive spike uh, in defaults. And this spike in defaults can be protected uh, via insurance to avoid the accumulation of, of risk. Working with the banking sector in this way allows the banks to lend a lot more than they would be comfortable without insurance protection. So in a way it's enhancing access to finance, uh, enabling farmers to invest more in their farms uh, to improve uh, productivity and, uh, and, and, and yields, thereby also creating economic uh, uh, resilience uh, 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 across the country. And maybe if I can just end on the note that uh, again, we go back to the primary importance of agriculture in the African context. It contributes uh, a third of the GDP, employs directly or indirectly of uh, two thirds of the, of the workforce. And there is no story that can be told about African development without taking into account uh, agriculture uh, and the potential there and the need obviously to protect all the investments that are being made in that sector. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, there's, there's a follow-on question that's from one of the listeners, um, which related to what you've just been chatting about, which um, is, is ARC an insurer and underwriting manager? If the latter, then on, on what insurance license do they operate? Is this market open to brokers to produce new business options, et cetera? Perhaps just uh, elaborate on that. Uh, 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 thank you. So ARC is registered as the private company as a Bermuda class two uh, mutual insurance company. So we're domiciled in Bermuda. The fact that we're a mutual company means that we are owned by the policy uh, holders, uh, which we refer to as the members. Our members include uh, African countries, as well as a number of development uh, uh, financial institutions, KFW, uh, FCDO, uh, SDC, uh, among others. Uh, we currently have a hundred million dollars of capital, which we deploy all across the African continent uh, uh, in the weather space. We are purely a weather parametric uh, insurance uh, play uh, at this point. There are obviously other companies that could have balance sheets that are bigger than us, but no one else is focused on weather in the way that we are. We are triple B plus rated by uh, Fitch, uh, which in Europe, uh, isn't a big deal, but in the African continent, it makes us one of the highest rated uh, insurance uh, companies. Uh, the way we work with the African countries is we uh, uh, oblige them to sign a treaty to become part of the ARC network. And this treaty confers on us privileges and immunities, which makes us exempt from local insurance regulations. And again, this advantage makes us uh, capital efficient because we don't need a license and capital in, in the subsidiary in every country that we operate in. And of course, we're always uh, welcome to working with brokers and partners. And if indeed there's anybody who is interested in hearing more about our work and how we can work together, we would be delighted to uh, uh, get in touch with Invest Africa and organize uh, a session to uh, speak to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leslie. I think we'll just do a final wrap up now. I'll just ask each of the panelists, um, perhaps just to say a minute or two of you know, opportunities and, and how they see the, the, the next uh, few years. Thanks. And perhaps we can start just with Bupin. Sorry, Bupin, I can't hear you. Could just talk about some of the you know potential opportunities you see uh you're on you're on mute sorry you're on mute i think he's having problems with his sound yeah we can't hear you. okay we'll come back if we can we can like we can't hear you perhaps nicole if you could just talk about you know the key opportunities ahead Oh, thanks. So, I mean, over the next couple of years, I think, you know, Africa really has an opportunity to step up and uh, take the place in, in kind of that world 
food chain that we can see, you know, Russia and Ukraine is, uh, has really let us down at this, at this point, you know, globally, you're seeing, um, you know, food shortages due to it. And I think just intra-Africa trade as well. I mean, you, you actually, you could solve a lot of your own problems just by looking at your neighbors. So I think the opportunity really is to start bringing together some of these global players to actually make, make opportunities happen on the ground. Um, you know, I think with all of these things, the tech exists in the rest of the world. The, you know, the productivity enhancements exist in the rest of the world. And it's about how do we actually bring them here and actually, you know, make the opportunities happen on the ground. Thanks very much, uh, Leslie. Uh, perhaps George, if you wouldn't mind uh, just saying a few final words. Yeah, um, I'm going to be positive. <laughs> so what have we got? What, what have we got? We've got, okay, so, um, well, the first thing we haven't talked about is the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. We've got that, it's it's rolling. Is anyone benefiting, benefiting from it at the moment? No, but it will. Um, I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will start, um, you know, gaining traction in the next couple of years, hopefully. Um, and that's about, you know, uh, trading with other African countries, keeping, you know, keep it, keeping the economies in Africa going. Um, internationally, yes, we're going to see capacity rise. Um, we mentioned 2024. I think we're going to be back to pre-COVID levels. 2023 we do have to have a we do have to understand that we're very much a uh, a consumer region but with agriculture can we turn that around uh, can we become a producing region like the, uh, like a, a lot of the regions uh, other regions in, in in the globe i hope so and what would that mean that means that from a, an express perspective uh, a career perspective we won't be reliant on commercial airlines. We'll be able to have full planes coming in and have full planes going out, which we can't do at the moment. That is okay, very, thanks, very George. important. I'm just going to uh, stop you there because we just need to get to Leslie and I'm hoping we get back to Bupin, but Leslie, perhaps just a few final words. Yeah, uh, then given uh, the impact of climate change, uh, protecting the agricultural value chain will become increasingly important. The developed countries pledged $100 billion per year to help Africa mitigate and adapt to the impact of climate change at COP26 last year. The bulk of this money is going to be invested in one way or the other in the agricultural sector. And we need to continue to find ways of protecting this additional investment that is coming in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leslie. Bupin, any final comments? I don't know if we can. Sure. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Thanks. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. I think uh, next two to three years' time, I see uh, one of the golden period coming up in Africa. Uh, simple reason: demand side is not an issue at all. 1.2 billion people are on the march to become 2 billion people in a couple of decades. So that is the demand side is taken care of. Supply side, for example. Many of the seed company, including ours, they while we produce locally, but also we import from more than one dozen countries. Some of them are Africa, some of them are Australia, and uh, and the USA, uh, the Americas. What I see now, what I you know by the panelists, I was I this, you know listening to them like DHL and other like like logistics cost is becoming unviable for us. So what we are doing, for example, now we are last week our supply chain leaders they were here in Africa Middle East. And now they are setting a plan for the capexes, produce the seed locally in Africa more and more. So, so to me, uh, we are gearing up, not only us, but uh, seed industry as a, as a whole, to cut down the uh, supplies or dependence on the import of the seed, start producing locally more and more, more and more. Thanks, so, Bupin. Let's finish up there because we're coming to the end of our time. But yeah. thank you very much to the panelists. That was a really great panel. We've solved a lot of the problems. We can replace a lot of the Ukrainian Russian crop we can de-risk through insurance and we can bring capital. There is capital coming as we can hear um, and to the right projects for the right um, partners. And uh, thank you everybody for listening in to the panel. Um, if you have any questions, please can you email Elizabeth Haskins. So in the chat, her email uh, address is shown there. And uh, if there's any follow-ups for any of us, obviously perhaps in the first instance, 
speak to her. We covered uh, most of the questions. Um, so I'll wrap it up there and uh, on time at 11, 11.30 UK time. But well done to the panel. That was a really fascinating, excellent um, session. And I'm sure it was well appreciated. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thanks then. Bye.